Chapter 4 Devon drove like he knew where he was going. I didn't doubt that he did, he'd been the pack Theron for almost four months now. During that time, he'd been working to get to know all the enforcers on the team, and not just to make sure that none of them were part of the elitist group like Weston Bauer, better known as West, and Troy Behrman had been. He wanted to know the men who worked for him, to know their strengths and weaknesses, so he could use it to the pack's best advantage. We hadn't known it at the time, but West and Troy had been working with Brandon during his banishment and feeding him information about me and what was going on here at home. When Brandon had turned himself in, he'd confirmed what we'd suspected. Because didn't know who we could trust, when Devon took over the team and assigned me a guard, he'd limited the number of enforcers allowed to guard me to those on the Anakitos team. Being on the Anakitos team meant not only were they the best on the team, but each one had also done something to earn the Anakitos trust. The group of enforcers we trusted had grown since then, but it still wasn't the entire team, not yet. Devon turned off the main road onto a long, narrow driveway that led to an older, well-kept home with a large metal barn off to one side. Driving past the house, he parked beside the barn. Come on, he opened the driver's door, slid out and held the door for me. Mouse should be waiting for us inside. Mouse was Mickey's nickname. I understood where it came from, but I wouldn't use it. It just felt off for some reason I couldn't explain. I slid across the seat and landed with a crunch on the icy gravel of the driveway. Waiting? Yeah, I called when I went in the house, asked him to turn on the heater and start warming the place up. Ah. I said as Gavin came around the truck and together, we headed for the small person-sized door near one corner. Inside I could see that the barn had been insulated, but left as one large room. It had weight equipment to one side, and a large area with a workout mat on the other. There was still a chill to the air, but a space this large would take a while to heat. Shrugging out of my jacket, I looked around for somewhere to hang it up. Devin took it and hung on one of a row of hooks behind the door. Come on, let's get warmed up. I said, heading for the mats. I kicked my shoes off and started stretching, getting my muscles loose so we could get started. One by one the men joined me, first Devin, then Gavin, then Mickey. I didn't know where he came from, but Raphael appeared on the mats next. Instead of stretching, Raphael and Mickey moved to one corner and started grappling. I kept one eye on the pair as I continued to stretch. They started out by facing each other, not touching, then, almost at the same time, they lunged at one another. Raphael easily flipped the much smaller Mickey onto his back. Mickey didn't stay there long, he quickly rolled and made it back to his feet. This time he danced out of Raphael's reach and moved around behind him to sweep the feet out from beneath the bigger man. Raphael landed on his back with a heavy thud and lay there a moment, the wind knocked from his lungs. Mickey danced nearby, enjoying the victory, until Raphael, still on his back, spun around and kicked Mickey's feet out from under him. They both lay on their backs laughing for a moment before Mickey got up and helped Raphael to his feet. Mouse, Devin called. Come over here a minute, will ya? Mickey came over and stood beside Devin. What do you need, boss? I want you to spar with Nikki. You're closer to her size, it should work out well. Mickey looked hesitant. You sure, boss? I work out every day, I wouldn't want to hurt her. Devin smiled. I'm sure. I'm not worried about you hurting her, but give her a good workout. I'll watch and see if I can figure out what we can do to improve her technique. I want her able to fight back should someone come after her again. Yes, sir. Mickey nodded once then turned to me. You ready? You bet. I grinned and led him a short distance away, just far enough that Devin and Gavin wouldn't be in our way. You sure about this? Gavin asked Devin as I bent my knees and braced. I grinned. This was gonna be fun. I waited, watchful, for Mickey to make the first move. Devin's response to Gavin was lost in Mickey's grunt when he went for me. I grabbed one arm and flipped him over my shoulder in a move much like the one Raphael had done earlier. 
Mickey hit the mat and rolled to his feet again, but I'd learned from watching him earlier, and I wasn't going to let him get behind me. I spun easily, keeping Mickey in front of me as he tried again and again to slip behind me or sweep my feet from beneath me. After several minutes I was tired of playing with him, and I fainted a punch toward his jaw. When he lifted his hands to defend himself I tucked low and ran, hitting him in the abdomen with one shoulder. Standing, I lifted him with me and flipped him over my body. He landed on his back and lay there stunned and blinking. Instead of gloating over my success, I went back, easily rolling his nearly limp body and planting one knee in the middle of his back. I grabbed one foot and curled it back until he was sweating. Enough. Devin called. I released Mickey's foot and moved away, grinning at the surprised look on Gavin's face. Mickey pushed himself upright. He looked at me a moment then at Devin, who merely smiled. You knew she's tougher than she looks, didn't you? Mickey asked. I did. Devin said. But I didn't lie about you being a good match for her. You're both fast and I want her to learn a little more finesse so she can rely on her strength a little less. Did you teach her that? Raphael asked, joining the group. Devin shook his head. She came to me that way I suspect we've got her brothers to thank for what she already knows. He looked at me, one brow lifted as if looking for confirmation. Rain mostly. I shrugged. He wanted me to feel safe. I doubt there are many humans that could survive tangling with you. Mickey said, pushing himself to his feet and stretching the stiffness out of his back, where I'd planted my knee. I was still human when he taught me. You've let it translate well with your new strength and speed. Raphael put in. I've always been fast, that's one thing he taught me to take advantage of. One thing? Gavin asked. What else? I felt a smile spread across my face, and I knew it wasn't my usual friendly smile, this one held a hint malice and mischief. I don't fight fair. Chances are, anyone who attacks me will be stronger or better trained. Rain taught me to fight dirty, to use any advantage I can find, even if that's picking up a weapon and using it as an equalizer. I haven't seen you do that. Devin frowned. I haven't been fighting to win, I've been sparring for exercise and trying to learn things. Besides, I don't want to hurt anyone not here. Devin was silent as he thought about it. What do you mean, fight dirty? Raphael wasn't quite as reserved. I shrugged. If I feel threatened, I won't hesitate to go for sensitive spots. Sensitive spots? Mickey asked. Groindo's eyes. I rolled my shoulders, trying to keep the feeling that I needed to defend myself, keeping my muscles from tensing as we stood talking. Raphael winced. You do play dirty. Not play, just fight. I said lightly. Okay, we need to teach her to use her speed and to temper her strength when she's fighting. We don't want her doing things she shouldn't be able to do, just in case something happens and the police are involved. Devin said. You think she could? Raphael asked. I know she can. The one time she and I sparred, she broke my back. My mate told him. It wasn't intentional though, and I want the next time she does something like that to be on purpose. Raphael's eyes widened and he looked at me with new respect. I kept my mouth shut. I knew I could do worse because I had. After Brandon had me kidnapped, I'd fought my way free. I'd killed a man before breaking my own arms to escape. It hadn't been all that long ago, and sometimes I still woke shaking and terrified after reliving that day in my nightmares. I was glad Devin didn't mention it either. We spent a couple hours going over moves and repeating them over and over. Raphael taught me to brace myself and counter the move he and I had both used against Mickey, so I wouldn't end up on my back on the floor. It would work with most shifters, and no human would be able to throw me, but Raphael was huge, and I ended up laying on the mat, staring up at the ceiling more than a few times. By the time we left I was tired and sore and I knew I'd be hurting the next day, but at the same time I felt good. 
better than I had in ages. We made it home in time to shower, change, and make it to my folks' place for dinner. I didn't get there early enough to help mom cook, as had become my habit in the last few years, but I was earlier than I had been in the last month. I was finally to a point where I didn't resent the normal happiness and chatty tendencies of my family. As he had for the last few weeks, Devin stayed close to me, joining mom and me in the kitchen while I helped her get things on the table. Babe, I said, stopping on my way to the table with a stack of plates in my hands. Really, I'm fine, you can go back in the other room if you'd like. There's no reason I can't help you here either. He didn't really argue, but he wasn't letting me send him away. Let him be, Nikki. Mom said, putting a stop to my protests. He's fine in here, and I certainly appreciate the help. I shook my head, then went back to setting the table. A few minutes later, my sister Brittany and her husband Tracy arrived their two children, Jimmy and Tammy, in tow. Jimmy barely stood still long enough to let Britt take his coat off before racing into the living room to see Grandpa. Tammy was a little more patient, but she was stuck in her dad's arms and couldn't run off quite so easily. Tracy was patient as he wrestled the thick coat off her tiny arms, then he set her down, a fond smile on his face, as he watched her run to greet her grandmother, then me. Aunt Nick, Aunt Nick? Her voice had gone high with excitement as she squealed her name for me. I bent to lift her up and hug her tight. I'd always been close to Brittany's kids, and Tammy was a darling. She was always happy to see me and let me love on her, tonight was no different. I held her tight and inhaled her unique strawberry candy scent for a moment before relaxing my grip a little. How are you doing, sweetheart? Grandpa, she shouted, kicking her feet to be let down so she could join her brother in the other room. All right, I laughed and set her back on her feet. Go see Grandpa. I watched her take off. Seconds later, I heard my father give a low grunt, and I knew she'd raced in and thrown herself in his lap without giving him a chance to brace himself or catch her first. Content that she was in good hands, I turned back to Brittany. How have you guys been? I looked at her a moment. Tracy followed the kids into the living room, and Brittany followed Devin and I back into the kitchen. We're good. She pulled a handful of flatware from the drawer and started laying it out next to the plates lining the table. I'm thinking about picking up a part-time job, just so I can get out of the house once in a while and have some adult interaction. That sounds like a good idea. Mom said as she moved to the stove. How does Tracy feel about it? Devin moved in behind Mom and took the hot pads from her, he motioned her to move to one side and pulled the large roaster from the oven. It had two good-sized beef roasts in it, and I knew he'd done it so she didn't have to lift the weight. He's okay with it. Brittany shrugged. Jimmy's in preschool and I can find a part-time daycare for Tammy. It will be good for her to spend some time around other kids. Mom put the two pans of rolls into the oven, which meant we'd be ready to eat in about 20 minutes. I took another look at the table, looking for anything missing. What kind of work do you have in mind? Devin asked. I don't really care. I just want to get out of the house. She fell silent for a second. I'd prefer something during the day, not odd hours. I don't want to give up family time, but if I can find something while Tras is working, I'd jump at it. I haven't heard of anything, but I'll keep an ear out for someone looking for help. I pulled salad dressing, butter, and other condiments from the fridge, setting them on the kitchen island where Devin picked them up and carried them to the table. Devin looked at me a moment, a slight crease between his eyes. I heard about someone looking for some part-time help, mostly clerical I think, but I'm not sure, and I don't remember offhand who it was. If you remember, let me know, Brittany said. Clerical work is no problem. Devin's frown deepened slightly as he tried to remember where he'd heard about the job. I'll do that. I know it wasn't all that long ago, but I don't remember who it was, I do remember thinking at the time that it wouldn't pay all that much. No worries, Britt said. I don't really care what it pays, it's not like I'd make much more than what daycare will cost anyway, but I need to get out of the house. 
It's no wonder you don't remember, Dev, Mom said. You've had a lot going on, newly married and the holidays and all. We all knew what she wasn't mentioning, and it had been bigger than getting married or the holidays. He'd spent most of his time for the last two months taking care of me, and we'd both grieved. It only took us a few minutes to finish putting everything on the table, and we were almost done, when I heard the front door open again. I looked at Devin, catching his eye and flicked my eyes toward the doorway, asking him without words if it was someone who should be there. He carefully sniffed the air, the movement was so small that if I hadn't recognized the movement and known what he was doing, I wouldn't have noticed it. I could have done the same thing, but his sense of smell was a little better than mine, and I was standing next to the stove. All I could smell was the rich, yeasty aroma of the rolls in the oven. It's Cam and Janelle. Devin's mental voice was calm and soothing. Sometimes I wanted to curl up in the feel of his mental voice. I know that sounds weird, but it's true all the same. I waited until Cameron called out, Where is everyone? before moving for the entryway. It wasn't a long wait, but it would have seemed odd if I had heard something the rest of my family hadn't. Since I had been closest other than Devin, I made it to the entry hall first. I hugged my brother, then pulled his longtime girlfriend Janelle into a hug as well. It's so good to see you, I said to her. You don't make it to dinner nearly often enough. I really liked Janelle, and I knew she wasn't staying away from the family dinners by choice. Rather, it was because of her job, scheduling for nurses at the local hospital was sometimes crazy, and not at all conducive to regular family time like the meals my mother held every Sunday. All my life, Sunday dinner had been mandatory. The only excuses for not being there, assuming you lived in the area, was work and being too sick to leave the house. I'm so glad to see you too, dear. How are you doing? She looked at me carefully, as if trying to see my inner turmoil. My sorrow wasn't gone yet, but it was no longer written on my face, at least not as deep as it had been, I gave her a small smile. I'm doing better. Mom moved in to hug Cameron and Janelle, and I tried to step back only to run into Brittany. The room felt suddenly warm and I tried to take a deep breath. I knew it was crazy but the walls felt like they were getting closer. My heart raced and I couldn't keep from breathing faster. The timer on the stove went off, and I took it as an excuse to get out of the close confines of the hall. Normally a big group of my family, even in a fairly small space, was comforting to me, but all of a sudden I'd felt claustrophobic, almost as if the number of people in the room was smothering me. Glad to be in the open space of the kitchen again, I went to the stove, shut off the timer and checked the rolls. Finding them ready I pulled them out and started putting them in towel-lined bowls for the table, using the familiar task to calm my frantic heart and slow my breathing. Brittany looked into the room and seeing that I had the bread handled, she glanced at the table a moment then turned back to Devon. Would you mind calling Dad and Tracy to dinner? Not waiting for an answer, she went to the fridge and pulled out the pitchers of tea, water, and juice, and took them two at a time to the table. Not at all, he said. I felt his eyes on me for a second, before he headed into the other room. A soft wave of comfort washed over me, coming from my link to Devon. He'd felt that moment of panic, and while he might not understand it, he was doing what he could to reassure me. Before Devon could return with the others, the front door opened again. Brain. Mom's voice was filled with happiness. I'm glad you made it, I was afraid you were going to be late. I almost was. I heard him respond, still out of sight. My shift ended up running long and I didn't have time to go home and change. He followed mom to the room. Without watching, I was aware of his every move. He went to Brittany and gave her a quick hug then came to me. Approaching me carefully, he dropped one hand on my shoulder as he came up behind me while I continued to put the hot rolls in the bowls. How you doing tonight, sis? He dropped his chin to rest on my shoulder so our faces were side by side. He was only a couple inches taller than me, so he didn't have to bend too far to do it. Pretty good. I tipped my head to one side to bump into his, it was something we'd been doing for years, and despite my recent bout of claustrophobia earlier, I found it comforting. 
You sure? He gave me a brotherly hug as his face stayed beside mine. I grinned. Yes, Sunshine, I'm sure. I knew the old nickname would annoy him, but it would also let him know I was feeling well enough to tease him. Brat. He stood upright and pinched my side as he quickly moved away to avoid my smacking him in return. I could have caught him if I'd tried, because of my faster-than-human reflexes, but I didn't even try. I laughed and waited until he was looking at me, waiting for a reaction, then I threw a roll at him. Beast. He wasn't expecting me to throw things, and the bread hit him square in the face. Laughter rolled from me at the shocked look on his face. Catching the mangled bun as it fell, he gaped at me. I can't believe you did that. Did what? I gave him a wide-eyed, innocent look. All right, you two, stop playing with dinner and come take your seats. Mom put a stop to our antics, but she didn't sound upset by them. I carried the bowls to the table and set them down before taking my seat. As I sat, I looked across the table at Cameron who shook his head and ran one finger along the index finger of the other hand, a classic shame on you motion. I stuck my tongue out at him, laughing all over again when his mouth fell open in surprise. Devin leaned over and kissed my cheek. I'm glad to hear you laughing again, baby. It feels good. I sent back, glancing at him. Dad cleared his throat and we all fell quiet. Joining hands with the people on either side of us, we bowed our heads, and waited. We didn't have to wait long. Dear Lord, Dad began. Thank you for the blessings we've received and the bounty of food before us. We thank you that everyone was able to make it tonight, and that we're all healthy and whole. Please bless this food that it may nourish our bodies and spirits. And keep everyone safe as they travel home this evening. Amen. We all repeated the last word, then conversation erupted around the table as we picked up dishes and passed them around the table serving ourselves as they went by. The sudden roar of noise reminded me of old screen shows that were filmed in front of a live audience. It was like someone had lit a giant applause sign, but instead of clapping and cheering there were voices and conversation. Dad was quiet at first, focusing on the food on his plate while conversation flowed around him. I watched my brothers, looking for signs that they were plotting revenge. You look a lot better than the last time I saw you. Janelle said. I was sure I did. The last time I'd seen her had been at the family's Christmas Eve dinner, I had been particularly depressed over the holiday. I'm feeling better, thanks. I gave her a faint smile, hoping she would drop the subject. I wasn't so lucky. Are you planning on trying again soon? she asked. You should really wait at least three months before trying to conceive again, Tracy spoke up. His advice was the same thing my Ob had told me, which made sense, since he was an OBGYN. Thankfully, he understood my reluctance to have him as my doctor. That would just have been weird. You need to give your body time to heal and your hormones a chance to level out before you stress them again. He had no way of knowing that I could do the same amount of healing in just hours that would take a normal human several weeks to repair. I wasn't so sure about my hormones, but that wasn't what I was worried about. We're not sure yet, we haven't really talked about it. Devin wrapped his arm around my shoulders as he answered in my place. My friend Alexis, who happened to be our pack healer, had told me the week before, physically at least, I'm completely healed and gave me the go-ahead to conceive again whenever we are ready. I relayed her instructions to Devin, but since the baby I'd lost hadn't been planned, I wasn't sure yet what we were going to do. I hadn't been able to think much about it before now. I let the subject drop. After a few moments, Janelle spoke again. Cameron asked me to marry him. Her voice was soft, as if she was hesitant to make a big announcement. I knew, even though she and Cameron had been seeing each other for a while now, our large family and our often loud and boisterous gatherings tended to intimidate her. My eyes grew big and my gaze flew to her left hand where I found a thin gold band that sparkled with several inlaid diamonds. That's wonderful news. I grinned at her. 
She smiled back, her face alight with happiness. What's wonderful news? Mom asked from the other end of the table. I can't hear what's going on down there. Janelle just told Nikki that I proposed. Cam spoke loud enough for everyone to hear. It's about time. Why didn't you say so earlier? Dad wanted to know. She asked me not to make a big announcement, she wanted to tell everyone in her own time. My brother wrapped his arm around the tiny woman beside him and pulled her close. Good wishes and congratulations were given to the couple from around the table, and I was glad that the topic had shifted from my loss to something more joyous. When the noise calmed and things returned to normal, Rain looked Cameron in the eye and asked, What happened? You finally realize you should take her off the market before she realizes she's got the short end of the deal? Cameron shot him a look that promised revenge, but didn't say anything as he bent to kiss Janelle on the cheek. I looked at Rain and concentrated on projecting my thoughts at him. Because he was a normal human, albeit a gifted one, it was a more difficult task than it would be with another Kitsune, and it was nowhere near the second nature it was when I spoke with Devon the same way. Watch it. I know who you're dating and I can always tell her how mean you are to me. I knew I'd succeeded by the slight widening of his eyes and the almost confused look he shot at me. Yes, it's me. He blinked and shook his head, as if trying to rid himself of some uncomfortable idea. If you get too mean I'll pull out the embarrassing photos. He scowled at me under his eyebrows. You're embarrassing, Janelle. You can tease him all you want when she's not around or not so sensitive to it, but not now. Rain gave me a surprised look, like it had never occurred to him that he was bothering Janelle. He met my gaze and nodded once, then let the subject drop.